In the ancient city of Corinth reigned a rather cunning man. His name was Sisyphus. He was probably the smartest man of his time. The smartest, but not the wisest. Sisyphus was a direct descendant of Prometheus. This deity had the boldness to stick his nose into the matters of Zeus and paid a high price for the intromission. And, much like his ancestor, Sisyphus decided to interfere in the gods' affairs. He witnessed the kidnapping of the young and beautiful Aegina by the eagle-shaped Zeus, and he realized he could take advantage of it. Although he was king of a glorious city, this metropolis struggled with a shortage of drinking water. Young Aegina was the daughter of Aesopus, a river god, who was deeply saddened by the disappearance of his daughter. Sisyphus went to Aesopus and declared, I know where your daughter is, but this information comes at a price. In return, I want you to create a spring of water to supply my kingdom. Aesopus accepted Sisyphus's offer and created a spring of the purest mineral water. Sisyphus revealed to him what he knew, and Aesopus went after his daughter. King Sisyphus was pleased. This new spring would be a source of abundance and even more prestige to his city. Zeus, the supreme lord of Olympus, was enraged by Sisyphus's revelation and ordered Thanatos, also known as Death, to find him and take his life. Some time passed before Sisyphus was surprised by seeing Thanatos in his palace, but an idea quickly sprung up in his cunning and mischievous mind. He went to death and said, So, it seems my time has come. I did not expect to die so young. However, I am much surprised by your splendor. Indeed, you are such a magnificent deity. You shall know that of the many gods I have known, few carry such a remarkable and elegant figure. And before I leave, I would like to present you with some ornaments that will make your presence even more dazzling. After all, these jewels will no longer be of use to me. Thanatos felt flattered with such a torrential stream of compliments and decided to accept the gifts. Sisyphus put a pair of silver bracelets and a necklace on Thanatos. However, those were shackles and a collar. The Corinthian king did what appeared impossible until that point. He managed to cheat death, and Thanatos became his prisoner. Time passed, and no one died anymore. The kingdom of Hades was no longer receiving any new subjects. On the banks of the river Acheron, Charon had no more passengers to cross the waters. The wars set by the god Ares were no longer a source of pleasure for him, as nobody died. The enraged Ares traveled to Corinth. He knocked down the palace door and broke the chains that imprisoned Thanatos. Free, the god of the dead was absolutely sure of his first target and started to search for King Sisyphus to complete the mission Zeus had handed him. But Sisyphus was expecting that. He told his wife that if he died prematurely, she would not render the royal funeral services. Sisyphus delivered himself peacefully to Thanatos, who took his life. Charon was already waiting to lead him to the kingdom of Hades, the lord of the underworld. The banks of the River of the Dead were filled with souls already on Thanatos' list, who only now had been sought. Upon arriving in the kingdom of Hades, he was face to face with the god of the underworld, who appeared quite unhappy. After being severely admonished by the great god, Sisyphus delivered a speech he had already devised, even before his death. Noble lord of the underworld, I'm aware of my wrongdoings against you and the harm I've caused, but that was not my intention. If I had known that I would harm the great god of the world of the dead, I never would have done so. Aware that I am in debt to you, I have a plea to make. My obnoxious wife refused to perform the proper funeral rites for a king, 
who was so dear to his people. That abominable woman tossed me out, as if I were nothing but a dog carcass. I therefore beg you to let me return to the world of the living for only one day, so that I may take revenge on my wife and set up a proper funeral, which would honor the kingdom of the dead. You have my permission to visit in the world of the living for only one day. However, by nightfall you shall return to my domains. Sisyphus gave his word that he would return promptly. Sisyphus returned to Corinth. There he met his wife and fled with her. Once again, he had cheated death. Now concealed, Sisyphus lived a long life and reached an old age until he encountered his inevitable end. And encountering Thanatos once more, his cleverness would no longer help him. Upon returning to the underworld, Hades sent him to Tartarus, where he received an appalling torment. Sisyphus was forced to roll a heavy boulder from a plain to a mountaintop, but every time he got close to the summit, the boulder became horrendously heavy and rolled back to the starting point. Then Sisyphus was condemned to restart his work for all eternity. In the distant kingdom of Phrygia reigned Tantalus, son of Zeus, with Princess Pluto. Due to his noble lineage, he had privileges at Olympus, sharing the table with the gods at the banquets. In his privileged position, he could hear the conversations and plots of the gods. Although he was entitled to all the hospitality of the gods when visiting Olympus, he did not respect his hosts. After leaving Olympus, Tantalus spread the secrets of the gods, which he listened to during the banquets. In another episode, he stole some nectar and ambrosia from the gods' table, food that conferred immortality and therefore was restricted to the gods. Due to their omniscience, the gods knew what Tantalus was doing. However, because they enjoyed his company, they ignored his actions and did not punish him. Tantalus wanted to repay the hospitality of the gods with a banquet in his palace. Zeus, Hermes, and Demeter accepted the invitation. The king accompanied the preparations for the banquet. He wanted the event to be perfect so that the gods would give him even more blessings. He called his son Pelops and said, My son, today you will have the honor to share the table with the gods of Olympus. Thank you, my dear father. Finally, I will have, like you, the privilege of being at the table in the presence of my glorious grandfather. The young Pelops walked radiantly towards his room to prepare himself for the banquet. Tantalus called the cook and said, Today you shall prepare the most splendrous meal. The king whispered something in the cook's ear, who could not hide his concern. The gods arrived at the palace, where they were received with all reverence. The banquet started to be served, and the guests talked about the most diverse subjects. Then, Zeus posed the question, Where is my grandson? You said he would be among us. Don't worry, father of mine. Soon he will be at the table with you. The moment of the main course arrived. The cook brought a beautiful stew with an unmatchable aroma. The goddess Demeter, who was in a deep sorrow due to the departure of her daughter Persephone to the kingdom of Hades, devoured the stew to slightly improve her mood. Tantalus served the stew to Zeus and Hermes. The two gods exchanged suspicious looks. Don't you like my offering to the gods? You degenerate creature, how dare you serve human flesh to the gods? It's not a mere human sacrifice, my father. It's the greatest sacrifice. I'm offering you the flesh of my firstborn son. Demeter, who had already eaten a large piece of flesh, felt sick. We have been complacent with your crimes in the past, but this deserves to be punished in an exemplary way. Tantalus was sent to Tartarus where he would suffer a terrible punishment. He was placed in a lake surrounded by fruit trees. The water covered him up to his chin, and the fruits were within reach of his hands. However, Tantalus constantly felt a terrible hunger and thirst. 
When he drew down to drink water, the lake level also dropped, preventing him from quenching his thirst. When the hunger appeared, he tried to reach the fruits over his head, but the wind pushed the branches and the fruit away. The gods decided to resurrect the innocent Pelops. They made him even more beautiful than before. However, one of his shoulders was missing, the one devoured by the goddess Demeter. Zeus asked Hephaestus to create an ivory shoulder for his grandson. Back to life, Pelops became king of the Peloponnese. Meanwhile, his father suffered eternal punishment in Tartarus, with the objects of his desire so close and at the same time so far away. King Ixion of Thessaly was a nefarious man who ruled his kingdom with an iron fist. In Thessaly, the best horses in Greece were bred, and only the best resided in the king's stud farm. The king fell in love with the beautiful Dia, daughter of Ionius, a nobleman of the region. Ixion promised Ionius that he would give him some of his famous horses in exchange for the hand of the beautiful young woman. However, after marrying Dia, Ixion didn't fulfill his part of the agreement, which outraged the now father-in-law. He decided to take justice into his own hands and stole Ixion's horses. Ixion was furious and came up with a plan to get revenge on his father-in-law. Ionius was invited to a meeting with Ixion in his palace on the pretext of making peace. Ixion received his father-in-law cordially but the king had a plan against his wife's father. King invited Ionius to visit a new division of his palace. This one had a moat, and when the visitor stretched his neck to see what was inside it, he was pushed by his son-in-law. Ionius fell into the ditch that was full of embers. The guest was consumed by the flames and cried out in pain to Ixion's satisfaction. And, before he was devoured by the flames, Ionius saw his daughter's charred body beside him. But Ixion's sins would not be forgiven. The king was deposed and became a vagabond, being stoned and spat at every place. After years of suffering, Ixion seemed to repent and asked the gods for forgiveness. Zeus took pity on the man who had once been a great king and invited him to visit Olympus. Ixion participated in celestial banquets and fraternized with Olympian deities, but his lack of character emerged again. Ixion fell in love with the goddess Hera, wife of Zeus, his host. He even confessed to the goddess his desire to be carnally united with her. Hera rejected him and told her husband everything. Zeus did not believe that his guest would be capable of such an act. To test Ixion, Zeus molded a cloud with the same outline as the goddess Hera. The goddess-shaped cloud flirted with Ixion. He did not hesitate and united with the false goddess. From this sin against hospitality, bizarre creatures were born, a mixture of man and horse that would become known as centaurs. Zeus expelled Ixion from Olympus. He wasn't more ruthless as he felt some empathy with Ixion. After all, as we know, the great god also struggled to contain his lust. But Zeus would regret his clemency. Ixion, after returning to the world of men, boasted that he had been with the Queen of Heaven, and that enraged Zeus. The supreme god fulminated Ixion with one of his rays, and his spirit was thrown into the depths of Tartarus. Ixion was put on a burning wheel, bound by serpents, he would spend eternity burning in the spinning wheel.